Greetings, citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful, creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we have going on right now, today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the murders of Sherry Faye Smith and Deborah May Helmick at the hands of serial killer Larry Jean Bell. And this is a serial killer that famous criminal profiler John Douglas called one of the most sadistic murderers he had ever met. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. They are all Bratter scene, but no pressure. So now that I'm done begging you to join my cult, we can get into this video. Now, this video is on another case that I had never heard of. Uh, I don't know if it's super popular and that I'm just under a rock, because that's definitely, um, been true in the past. But basically, I was researching another case and an article on this one popped up on the side. And when I read the article, I was like, huh, that's very interesting. And like, honestly, super messed up. Because basically, the article said that this man, Larry G. Bell, was a man who murdered this beautiful young woman and then proceeded to torment her family, like calling them over and over, calling them when she was just missing and not, not, had not yet been found. Um, making them think that, that she would be found and giving them hope that she was alive. And then after she died, he continued to call them and just like rub salt in their wounds. So I was like, damn, like that's just unimaginable. And then I kept reading and I found that he had actually not only killed this one girl, even though this is the part of the story that's the most popular, he had also killed another girl. He was convicted of killing two girls and that it's believed that he killed many more. The more I read, the more interested I got, and the more upset I got. It's a very upsetting case. He is a very upsetting man, but it was so interesting. There was so much to this case, and I just spent hours on newspapers.com because this is a case from the 80s, and I read all the things, so you don't have to. So today, I'm going to tell you the whole story, and while I do, I'm going to be putting on a full face of makeup, hence the makeup in Morbid Makeup. Now, if that's not really your thing, that's cool. Thanks for hanging out this long. I hope you find a channel that tells you the story in a way that you prefer. But if you're on the fence and you're not sure how you feel, maybe stick around. You could be surprised by how much you like it and also me. And if you're ever curious what makeup I'm using, it'll be listed in the description box for your convenience. Now, at the end of this video, after I've given you all the information, all the details, I want you to answer a question of the day. And that is this. Do you believe that Larry Jean Bell is responsible for more murders than the two he was convicted of committing? And now with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murders of Sherry Faye Smith and Deborah Mae Helmick at the hands of serial killer Larry Jean Bell. Okay, where does one even begin with this story? Well, okay, I guess we can begin by jumping in our handy dandy time machine and we're going to head pretty far back. We're going to head back to May 31st, 1985. And this is like a hot, hot summer day in South Carolina. On this day, 17 year old Sherry Faye Smith was arriving home for the day. She had gone out that day and gone to a senior pool party um, because she was about to graduate and it was like, again, hot as hail in South Carolina. She had gone to this pool party on her way home. She had stopped, seen her boyfriend and she was just getting home for the day. So she pulled her car up to the curb uh, to check the mail on her way in like she always did. So right at that moment, as Sherry pulled up, her dad was actually working from home. He had like a home office on the second floor of the home and he looked out the window and he saw her pull up. So he was like, cool, cool. She's about to come in. Like it was going to be just a second because the family did have like a pretty long driveway. They had a big property. So the driveway was like 70 yards, but he saw her pull up. She got out. She was so close to home. She was so close to safety, but it was at this moment that something horrible was going to happen. And this was just a month shy of her 18th birthday. Sherry Smith was a typical teenage girl. She was born on June 25th, 1967 to Hilbert and Robert Smith, who went by Bob, and she was born in Columbia, South Carolina. Sherry was the middle child. She had an older sister named Dawn and a younger brother named Robert Jr. Sherry had attended and was just about to graduate from Lexington High School, and it was there that she became really popular and really well known for having a very pretty singing voice and a, quote, happy spirit. 
She was voted as wittiest and most talented in her senior class, and she was really well liked, and her family was really well respected in the community. They weren't exactly wealthy by any means, but they did own a business that was doing well. They owned a big house on a big property that had a big, long driveway. So Sherry was scheduled to graduate just days after she went missing, and she was even going to be the person that was going to sing the national anthem, because as I said, her and, and her sister Don, they were both accomplished singers, but since she wasn't there, instead the staff, the students, the audience, they all had a moment of silence for their missing classmate, and an empty chair sat where she should have been there to graduate. Sherry had planned to go on a cruise to the Bahamas after she graduated, which is something that sounds like so much fun. And then she was going to be starting um, at Columbia College, majoring in music, I believe, in the fall. She was just like a nice girl, a girl with a boyfriend and a collection of koala bears. I guess koala was the um, mascot of the school she was going to go to. So she had a bunch of like little koala bears in her room. And she was the type of girl who went to church every Sunday. You know what I mean? I believe her dad even like worked with the Lord. He did some sort of Lord's work. Um, so, you know, she was very involved in that. And her and her sister Dawn even sang in the choir at church. Sherry's father said that Sherry was the glue. She was what held their family together because she was the one that was just always happy, which is just a really sad statement to have read. But speaking of her father, let's get back to her father in that day. So her dad waits for her to come in. He waits about 10 minutes and then he's like, huh, she didn't come in the house. So he went to the window to look out and see what he could see. So I guess like Sherry's routine is when she would come home for the day, she would always immediately go into her dad's office and give him a big hug. Like they had a very close relationship. So when she didn't do that, her absence was quickly noticed. So her dad went to the window and looked out and that's when he saw that Sherry's car was still there, but he could not see Sherry. So he freaked out and he went down there to investigate and he actually got in his car and drove down there. So that's how long the, the driveway was. It wasn't like a quick rundown, he had to drive. And when he got down there, he saw something that really like, it must've made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. So he gets down there, Sherry's car's there, the door's open, the motor's running, okay? Her purse, all of her stuff is inside, but she is nowhere to be found. There are footsteps in the like dirt, like the, the earth, footsteps on the earth leading up to the mailbox, but none leading back to the car. And I'm 99% sure that the mail was on the ground. So that already parents worst nightmare, human beings worst nightmare. It's horrifying, but to make matters worse, Sherry had a rare form of diabetes. So she had a medication that she had to take, like it was, she had to take it. And that medication was still in the car as well. So at first he tried not to panic. He was like, okay, maybe she is just off in the woods nearby. And at first I was like, that's a weird thought process to me. But apparently the reason he thought this is because Sherry had this rare form of diabetes. In addition to taking the medicine, she also would drink like shit tons of water. Like that was something that she was known for was drinking a lot of water. And sometimes her little bladder just couldn't take it. You know what I mean? She wasn't going to make that 70 yard drive up the driveway. She had to go and she just had to go. So he's like, okay, maybe she's in the bushes over there, like just relieving herself. So he goes and he starts looking for her. He calls her name, gets no response. And he's like, okay, something's wrong here. And it's at this point that he has the awful task of going up and telling his wife that their child is missing. And I guess when he told her, she just like freaked out and she's like, oh my God, like not my Sherry. And at that point they called the cops. Now it was quickly determined by police that Sherry was not a runaway. And honestly, I was like, why would they even like the fact that they even like considered that to me, I guess I have to consider it. But the fact that that's even something that like seemed possible to me seems really dumb. Like you are dumb. You are really, really dumb. Cause like, why the heck would she drive all the way home? I guess they own their property was like on the outskirts of Columbia. So why would she drive? all the way home just to then abandon her car and all of her things and run away. Why wouldn't she just take that car and all of her stuff and run away with it all? You know what I mean? It seemed kind of dumb, but either way, it was something that was discussed, but they quickly were like, yeah, this is obviously not the case because that wouldn't make any sense here. So they took it really seriously and they actually did file a missing persons report right away, even though generally at this time in this area, they would, I think they still had that like 24 hour law, like they would have to wait 24 hours, but they took it really seriously and they filed her as a missing person right away. At this point, a massive search was launched. It was said to be the largest search in South Carolina's history, at least at the time. And there were literally hundreds of police officers, 
and just volunteers searching in the blazing summer heat. People looked on foot, on horseback, in helicopters. They even looked in planes that had infrared that were brought in from Washington, D.C. But no matter how hard they searched, there was just like no sign of her. They had a search area of 25 miles in all directions from her home, but still nothing. And they even went as far as calling the FBI in to assist in the investigation. Officials even said, okay, that they were calling on Crime Stoppers to bring in a film crew and come and create a reenactment of the disappearance to see if they could generate like any leads. They were doing the most. They were doing everything they could to try to find this girl. She really, she really did get like the exact type of attention that every missing person should get. Let's just say that. And I know that that's a perfect world situation, that the resources aren't there, that it's not practical. I'm sure somebody will say that, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be that way. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Now this would be impossibly hard, right? To have your daughter literally taken from right in front of your home, just be snatched up in broad daylight and to have no idea what happened to her, who had her, if anyone had her, like what the situation was. There was no information. It was just like complete dead end, but somehow it was going to get worse. Well, I don't know. I don't know what's worse knowing or not knowing, but it was going to get awful. Um, let's just say it was going to get, to me, I think worse. And that's because a couple of days after Sherry went missing, the family phone rang. And on the other end of the line was a man. And this man started telling the family that he had Sherry, that he had taken Sherry, that he had abducted her and he was holding her. And he was able to prove that he wasn't just some random asshole, like messing with, I mean, he was some random asshole messing with the family 100%, but he was able to prove that he was the random asshole messing with the family that did take Sherry because he was able to describe to them the bathing suit that she had been wearing under her clothes that day when she was abducted. This man went on to tirelessly harass this family while they're doing everything they can to find her doing all these searches. This man is calling them over and over and over to harass them. He would taunt them. He would say that, yes, he had Sherry, but that she was fine, that the two were buds, that they had a relationship, that she was just watching TV, that she was eating enough, that he'd be letting her go soon. Not to worry. He was making sure that she got enough water. Bullshit, 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 bullshit. Okay. That's what he was doing. When in reality, things were not that, and things were going to get progressively worse with each call because he started saying super weird shit. Okay. He started saying things like Sherry was being with him and that their two souls were becoming one, which is like not not what you want to hear. Not what you want to hear. Not what you want to hear. Hilda, Sherry's mother, had a very difficult time while this was happening. And she said of this time, and I quote, I prayed to die. The pain was so bad. I just couldn't live with it. I pleaded with the Lord. I know I'm going to be with you. So please, please, please let me die. This was just terrible for her family, man. I don't understand how they dealt with it. I really don't. It seems impossibly hard. He wasn't giving them any proof that their daughter was alive. So they just had to keep taking these calls in hopes to get more information. And of course, at this point, police are like heavily involved. So they're also wanting them to take the calls because one, they want to try to trace the calls. And two, they're realizing that the more he calls, the more he inadvertently gives them information on himself through just like the basic things that he says and the better chance they have of actually catching him. So from these calls, police were able to tell that most, not all, but most of the calls were coming from pay phones. So they would try to get him to stay on the phone long enough to be able to trace him to these places. But back then to like trace a call, it took 15 full minutes. So he didn't generally stay on the phone that long with the family. And if he did stay on that long, by the time they would trace it and get all the way over there, he would already be gone. They would try like setting up roadblocks and, you know, searching cars and things like that, but they were never successful in actually catching him. But they tried like every day that Sherry was gone, they tried to catch him and tried to like crack this guy. For 28 days from the disappearance of Sherry to when sh her killer was actually caught. Cause yeah, dude, it took almost a month for them to bring this guy in the Smith family's home, their yard was completely taken over by police and FBI. They had set up a station there where they could, you know, basically run the investigation from their home since he had been calling their home. They were coordinating the manhunt, tapping the phone calls, and even going as far as escorting, excuse me, that's a weird word for my mouth to say, escorting Sherry's mom and her brother to like the grocery store and to like school events. 
From these calls, police were also able to determine that the man responsible likely was somebody who worked with electronics or might have even been an electrician specifically by trade because he was, I didn't even mention this, but when he was calling, he was electronically altering his voice and they believed he was using something like, like a scrambler device electronics and this was the kind of thing that at least back then i don't know if it's still the case like you would need to have some sort of knowledge and access to even have something like this so they were like he definitely does some sort of work with electronics or how else would he be able to be doing what he do be doing right now essentially sherry's family pleaded through the media to their daughter's abductor, doing everything they could to try to appeal to them or even just to get a message to Sherry while she was with the man who took her. And her father said specifically in one of these interviews or one of these like, yeah, press conferences, if you will. And I quote, we simply want to say whoever it is that has our daughter, Sherry, we want her back. We miss her. We love her. Please send her home where she belongs but he didn't send Sherry back. Instead, he called the family again, requesting to speak to Hilda. He always wanted to speak to the women of the house, whether it be Hilda or Sherry's sister, Dawn. And on this day, he wanted to speak to Hilda. He talked to her, and then right before getting off the phone with her, he told her that she should expect a letter coming in the mail the following day. So police hear this, and they immediately, immediately are like, oh, we need to go and intercept this letter. So the police and Sherry's father head to the post office to see if they can get the letter before it even goes out in the mail. And they are able to do so. They find this letter. It's brandishing a duck stamp. And it says on the front that it's addressed to just the Smith family. And once they open this letter, they lose a bit of hope that they're going to get Sherry back alive. The killer had made Sherry write a letter to her family. It was a two page letter on like yellow striped legal pad paper. And this letter was titled Last Will and Testament. The letter was dated June 1st, 1985, apparently written at 3.10 AM. And in it, she told her family that she loved them for them not to let this ruin their lives. On the side, it simply said, God is love. And she was surprisingly um, positive considering what she was writing because that's so, that's so fucking sad, dude. She wrote, among other things, quote, I'll be with my father now. And she tried in her last moments to console her family, knowing how hard her loss would be for them, telling them not to let this ruin them, not to let it make them hard, and that basically all good things happen for those who trust and love the Lord. I just find this to be incredibly sad. Like, I don't even know how I would deal with reading a letter like that, especially from my child, um, who I was hoping to get back alive. It's just like too much. But her dad strangely found comfort in this. I don't know how you could, but I I'm not in that situation. He said that this letter was more comfort to him than anything else in this case had been, because just knowing that she had that sort of faith in the Lord was something that was soothing to him. Now, she also wrote something else in this letter, and this is something that is incredibly chilling to me, just like ugh, gives me the complete EBGBs. And I just, I can't imagine being in her position writing this. She wrote in like the center of the page, no lead up to it, no sort of like conversation about it, just in the center of the page in parentheses, it said, quote, casket closed. I can't, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine being her. I can't imagine being her family. Her father actually did read this letter. He was allowed. It wasn't just like told to him what was said by the investigators. He was allowed to actually read it himself. And I can't, I just, he said that she seemed at peace, but that he was still heartbroken. And he was just worried. Like he had no idea how he was going to tell his wife what he had just read. I cannot even imagine how you would tell your wife what you just read, but he did. He had to tell her. And I think about receiving that information and my heart could just disintegrate into a million pieces. I can't even imagine that to think about the fact one, you're not getting your child back. Like you, you have to know at that point that you're not, but then have to think about like your child being in that position to write that, to know what's going to happen to her, to have that realization. That is just so much for any person to bear. And her poor family didn't even get a chance to process this because this asshole literally called them, I think twice the day that the letter was was received. During one of these calls that day, he said something to Hilda, which is just like the last thing that any person would want to hear. 
okay, after receiving their child's last will and testament that this asshole made her right. He said to this girl's mother, and I quote, Sherry is now part of me, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Our souls are now one. Now, this seems like the most fucked up of calls you could get, right? Somehow, this just gets worse and worse. I know, it. I'm just like, and then it got worse, and then it got worse, and then it got worse. It's just so messed up. So, the letter was dated June 1st, right? Remember I told you? Well, on June 5th, he called, and Hilda took this call. And on this phone call, he gave her detailed directions to a location where he said Sherry could be found. He implied that she would be found alive. And he ended this call saying to Hilda, quote, we're waiting. God chose us. The police head to the location that this man had given them over the phone. And Hilda begged to go. Like, she wanted to go with them. She wanted to be there when they found Sherry. But they told her they didn't think it was a good idea. They convinced her not to go because they were hopeful that they'd find Sherry. But they weren't feeling, like, super confident that that was going to be, um... You know what I mean? Like, they, they, was, they weren't... They didn't think it was good for her to be there. So they drive there. They get there. And, of course all of their worst fears are confirmed. Sherry was dead and her body was exactly where the man said it would be in a wooded area of the backyard of a large white structure, less than 20 miles West of Sherry's home. She was found wearing the yellow top and white shorts she had last been seen in. And the autopsy showed that she had been dead about four days. The medical examiner concluded that she had likely been killed within 12 hours of being abducted. It is believed that Sherry was killed on the day that she wrote the last will and testament letter at 4.58 a.m. Because this letter was dated 3.10 a.m. And on a phone call after they received that letter, uh, he had been speaking to Sherry's sister Dawn. And he had told her that on that date, which was June 1st, was when it was dated, at 4.58 a.m., that's when their souls had become one. So they believe, police believe, that he had inadvertently told them when he had killed her because clearly she didn't die before then because she had written the letter. But based on the timeline and that, it seems like that's when she was killed. The medical examiner wasn't able to tell like conclusively what the cause of death was because she had been left outside in the summer heat all this time. So like decomp had really taken its toll on her, but it was believed that she had either been killed by suffocation, like smothering or from extreme dehydration from not taking her, um, diabetes medicine and not drinking enough water. But there was definitely um, evidence to suggest the smothering more so than the dehydration, which we will get into shortly. You know, let's just, let's just get into it now. After Sherry's body was found, this dick, as I said, continued to call her family. And in one of these calls, he told her sister Dawn exactly what he had done to Sherry, what he had done to her sister. He said that he abducted Sherry at gunpoint he took her back to wherever he was keeping her. He raped her. He sodomized her. And then he wrapped her head in duct tape to suffocate her. And when they looked at her body, there did seem to be evidence that her head had been duct taped because they had found like sticky residue on her head. And parts of her hair had actually been cut where it looked like he had been removing the tape and like couldn't get it out. So he just cut it out, um, which is just like, hmm. He's telling his, he's telling her sister this, you know what I mean? Like she's hearing this about her baby sister and it's just too much for my brain. And in addition to telling her exactly what he had done to her, what he claimed he had done to her, he also told Don to make sure to give this information to the police so that the medical examiner could get an accurate cause of death, which I was just like, so you want them to get an accurate cause of death, but yet you left her out in the heat for all these days to obscure evidence to make sure they couldn't get the exact cause of death. Okay, guy, that checks out. You make sense. Police and the family kept, you know, trying to appeal to this killer, trying to get him to come forward, but he didn't. Instead, he just kept calling the family and tormenting them. And this is why John Douglas said he was most, one of the most sadistic murderers he had ever come in contact with, because it wasn't enough for him to just murder Sherry. He also had to make her family suffer. This dick even called them on the day of her funeral, telling them that he had been there. And it's possible that he was. There was a lot of people. There was like a thousand people at her funeral. It was very, very big. It was a large event, right? Like, cause it, you know, well, dropping things. 
And speaking of her funeral, it's so ridiculous. So there's all these people, right? There's a thousand people. So there's a lot of people that I'm sure didn't even, like, know Sherry. And during the funeral, one guy, like, jumped out of the crowd and just started yelling out into the crowd. And he's like, whoever did this to her, like, I know you're here. Tell us who you are. Show yourself. I love you and I won't hurt you. Just, like, come out. And this guy made everyone freak the hell out. Like, people started freaking out. One of Sherry's friends, like, started crying and fell to the ground because she thought that, like, the killer was there and he'd be coming to get her. And it just caused, like, pandemonium, dude. And it's so... I don't know if this guy was known to the family, but if he wasn't, like, think of what a dick move that is to do that at this child's funeral. It's just like, uh, it makes me fucking crazy. But the point is, that was a side note, the point is he called this family at the night of the funeral. Like, let these people be, right? Let these people grieve. You are the worst. And this time he wanted to talk to Dawn. He wanted to talk to Sherry's older sister. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but Dawn was beautiful and she looked just like Sherry. So he wanted to talk to her. During this call, this man tells Don like, what happened was an accident. He didn't mean to go that far. Just things spiraled out of control. And she was just like, was my sister at peace? Like, was she at peace when she died? And he said, yes, that she was at peace, that she was happy to become an angel. And at this point, Hilda like freaked out and like took the phone and was like yelling at him. was like, did you tell her you were going to kill her? You know, just emotions. And he said, yes, that he had told Sherry he was going to kill her and that he had even given her the option of how to die and that she had chosen suffocation. Now, during this call, he slipped something that is super like, makes you, makes you do this. While talking to Dawn, he said to her, quote, all I wanted to do was make love to Dawn. She's like, I'm sorry, what did you just say? And he's like, oh, 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 you know, sorry, I meant to say Sherry. I just wanted to make love to Sherry. But it is thought by police that at this point, this man had switched his focus, his infatuation to Dawn. Dawn, who was beautiful. Dawn, who looked like Sherry. And that's horrifying. I mean, Dawn was protected, though, right? Like, she was protected. She was surrounded by police, FBI all the time. So he, at this point, had to take out his infatuation, frustration, on somebody else. And that brings us to our second victim. Two weeks, almost to the hour after Sherry was abducted, the next girl was kidnapped. And this was nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick, nine years old. This little girl was stolen from her front yard in front of her home as she played in the grass with her brother. This child was literally just playing in the grass with her sibling when a car drove by, circled back, drove back by them, got out, grabbed Deborah, put her in his car and sped off. This guy was described as being in his thirties because he was actually seen. There was two witnesses who saw this and Deborah's dad was in the uh, home. They had like a mobile home and he was in the home really close by when this happened. But just like Sherry's dad, he didn't see or hear anything, but a neighbor did and like ran to the door and banged on the door and told him what happened. And she said that she saw this man get out of the car, grab Deborah around her waist and she was kicking and screaming and fighting and he just put her in the car and she got such a good view that she could even see that Deborah, while she was in the car was like kicking the ceiling of the car as he sped off. Searches were conducted for Deborah, just like with Sherry they went all the way to the county line looking for her but they didn't find anything either and now I'm going to include photos of Deborah that I'm able to find but there's something weird when it comes to her specifically. So it's worth mentioning that on Deborah May Helmick's Find a Grave page, there is a photo of like a completely different child, it looks like, than is used in all of the like news reportings of this case. Like it looks like a totally different kid. And on the Find a Grave, it even says like, this is the real Deborah May Helmick. We don't even know who the kid is that was used on the headstone photo like find a grave keeps taking down the real memorials like i don't know what's going on here but there's some sort of shadiness regarding deborah like i don't know what's going on things about deborah may helmick are just kind of vague in general it seems like she didn't get the same in my opinion it seems like she didn't get the same sort of attention and consideration that sherry did and everything about her is vague like when you look into this case you see a ton of information on Sherry, but you don't see nearly as much on Deborah. And that could be for many reasons. It could be that she didn't get as much attention. It could also be that her family didn't speak out as much after the fact. I'm not sure which one of those things is true. But to me, she just seemed like a footnote in this case, which was really sad for me because she was a literal child who was ripped from in front of her home 
savagely murdered, God knows what else, and um, that is horrible, and she deserves just as much representation as Sherry. And you know me, I wish I could give you more information on her, but really, even finding information on her was hard. I went through newspapers.com and I was able to get some, but there just isn't a lot out there on her. I just hope, I'll end with saying, I hope that her family got the same consideration from police that Sherry's family did, and move on. These abductions terrified people in the area. Like, I can't even imagine what it would have been like at that time. Girls, teenage girls started going places together in groups. They were too afraid to go places alone. And parents stopped letting their kids play outside alone because, I mean, a child, two, two kids were literally stolen from right in front of their homes. Like, this was terrifying. Now, police didn't immediately connect the cases because the girls didn't really have that much in common to connect them. Sherry was 17, Deborah was nine. They were also from seemingly different walks of life. Sherry's family not being wealthy, but being fortunate, and Deborah's family just doing what they could, both parents working to keep their heads afloat, which is actually why Deborah's parents did not receive phone calls like Sherry's parents did after she was taken, because Deborah's family didn't even have a phone. But the families were the same, right? They were both suffering the same thing, they were both going through the same trauma they had both had their babies stolen from them. Sherry's father, Bob, said as soon as he heard about Deborah being taken, he started to pray for them and hoped that they would get the same sort of peace that Sherry's family had. They said that they had only gotten their peace through God, and they were hoping that this would help Deborah's family as well. And they really needed the help. They did not cope well with losing their daughter. Deborah's father even had to quit his job so he could stay home and help take care of the two's other two children because his wife like blacked out in a depression and all of this was before they had even found Deborah's body. So once police like kind of put two and two together and start seeing the cases as possibly, possibly being related, they're not feeling super positive, right? They're not feeling positive that they're gonna get Deborah back because of what had happened to Sherry. Police are not feeling tight about this. And then it gets worse. The killer's like, you know what? I'm done calling. And he just like flat out stops calling, stops trying to talk to the Smith family, completely cuts ties with communication. And at this point, police are freaking out because they don't want another dead child on their hands, right? They, they just don't. And it seems like this guy is working systematically, right? He takes Sherry and then two weeks, almost to the hour, he takes Deborah. So they're like, he is likely going to continue what he's doing. This seems to be something he likes. He's having fun with it. Um, this is a problem. So police decide that they're gonna come up with sort of a plan, a plan to kind of lure him out. And their plan involves using Don, Sherry's sister, as bait to lure him out because he had developed sort of infatuation with her. And they were like, don't worry, she'll be totally safe. We'll be watching her every step of the way. She has all the protection. But can you even imagine this man had literally murdered their other child? Can you imagine them being like, we would now like to use your remaining daughter as bait to lure out the killer of your first daughter? I don't know what, I don't know what I would do. So basically the plan was, is they were going to have a memorial service for Sherry and Dawn obviously would be there and police would be coming as well. And what they were going to do is have Dawn bring one of Sherry's koala bears. Now this seems super random, I know, but I promise it was part of the plan. Basically what they were going to do is they were going to have Don leave the koala bear at the gravesite after the memorial service and police are hoping that this guy's watching, he may even be there, and that he is going to try to go and take the koala bear or at the very least go and admire it because it was left by Don and he had developed an infatuation with her. They went as far as publicizing this memorial service to make sure that the killer, if he was watching the news, would see that it was going to happen. And then they did exactly what the plan was. Uh, Dawn went, she left Sherry's koala bear, hoping that he would be interested, or at the very least, it would prompt him to call again because he would have just seen the girl he had become infatuated with. Now, I don't believe this happened, just for clarity, I don't believe that this happened at Sherry's actual funeral. I read that she had a sort of memorial service her family gathered at her grave on what would have been her 18th birthday. Um, so I'm not 100% sure on the timeline. I didn't get it 100%, you know, what am I saying? <laughs> I could be wrong on the timeline here. It could have been at the memorial service for her 18th birthday or it could have been at her funeral. But the point is they did this and 
it wasn't successful in him being seen. He didn't go and admire the bear. That was not something he did. But it did get him to call the Smith home again. During this call, the killer said to Don that he wanted to take her next. He said specifically that God wanted her to be with Sherry Faye. I can't even imagine what that, what hearing that would be like, right? Um, but she was protected, right? But he was like, listen, you can't be protected forever. So I'll see you when I see you. And he ended this call with giving Don more directions. These were going to be the directions to Deborah May Helmick's body. And he ended the call with, quote, God forgive us all. So Deborah was kidnapped on the 14th and she was found five days later in a wooded area near U.S. Highway 1 in Lexington County. Like with Sherry, the summer heat had not been kind to the crime scene and decomposition had really um, taken a hold of the situation. You know what I mean? She had to be identified by her hair and her clothes. Deborah was found out in the elements and she was wearing the same tank top and shorts that she had been wearing when she was abducted, but she was also found wearing a pair of adult women's silk underwear over her own cotton children's underwear. And like with Sherry, she had adhesive material found in her hair. At Deborah's funeral, the funeral director, the pastor, the priest, I'm not sure what the religion was. I'm not sure what the technical name for him would be, but he reflected on the situation and he said specifically, and I quote, this is a very difficult time for us all. We are afraid, angry, and confused. We are sad and broken. We are afraid for our children. We don't feel safe in our own front yards. We distrust every stranger. We ask, when will it end? Following Deborah's death, the phone calls continued, not to Deborah's family, but to Sherry's. So the killer hadn't called police in a while. And I actually don't even know if I mentioned this, that in addition to calling the Smith family, he would also call police. I think he also called like members of the media. Like he was a real attention whore. But since he hadn't called the police in a while, they wanted to try to get him talking. They needed to get more information out of this guy. They actually started doing this before Deborah's body was found. They asked Dawn if she could be the one to take the calls, right? Because he had become interested in her. Maybe she could talk to him get him talking, get him staying on the phone longer so they could trace the call, right? They were hoping to find Deborah alive at that point, but as we know, that did not happen. Um, so they get her to talk to him. They're like, hey, be nice to him, appeal to him, but make him feel like he's in charge. Do what you can to keep him talking longer. So one, we can try to trace the call and two, we can try to get enough information to put together a criminal profile. And we're going to get into the criminal profile a little bit later. So police were able to put together and release a composite sketch of the man they believed was responsible for these abductions and murders. They actually released two. They released one, released one, they released one. And then they got all the witnesses together from both individual abductions, brought them together and they created another composite sketch and they released that one. The descriptions came from both the woman who saw Deborah being abducted in front of her house. And also there was a witness to Sherry's abduction or they believed to Sherry's abduction. So a lady had been driving by um, right before Sherry was abducted and had seen a man driving by right before the abduction was said to have happened. Apparently this man was like driving and saw Sherry and was like leaning over the passenger side, trying to get a closer look at her. And he was like, so intent on looking at her that he like veered into the wrong side of the road into like oncoming traffic. So it definitely made her take notice of him. The man police were looking for was described as being 35 to 40 years old with a medium build and light receding hair. The witnesses who saw Deborah's abduction described him similarly, only stating that he was maybe a bit younger, stockier with darker hair and a beard. And some witnesses said the car was red and others said the car was silver. So it's like something, it's, it's a starting point. The composite sketch ended up being blasted everywhere. It was on TV, it was in newspapers, it was on flyers posted up in like all local shops. And with the popularity of the case, uh, came the circus, as I'm sure you can imagine. People love, just love, just love to be involved in these things. People were saying they had dreams about what happened. Everyone knew the man in the sketch. They knew somebody who looked just like them, just like them, just like him. They had an idea who it was. And several people even got arrested for giving false leads, for literally trying to extort money out of Sherry's family since they had money. Like how? 
I, it's, it's crazy to me that I'm surprised that people suck considering what I talk about every single day, every single day. Well, kind of every single day. I might not talk about it with you every single day, but I talk about it every single day. Like I'm still often surprised by how much people, um, actually suck. Like seemingly good people suck. Men with beards who had nothing to do with anything were harassed. The cops were called on them for absolutely no reason. And a lot of people were afraid that they were going to get killed. Like guys with beards were like, I'm going to get killed by somebody who's out here trying to be a vigilante. And I mean, they had a reason to be scared because gun shops in the area reported that all their sales went up. So it was on June 24th when police came out and finally told the public that they believed that these two murders were related. Cause like, remember they didn't think they were connected and then maybe they thought it, but they weren't saying it on the June 24th. They were like, listen, we think they are related. We think they're being um, committed by a serial killer who kills by the clock. And we are now trying to put together all the information we can to put, to put together, to get all the information we can to put together a psychological profile on who this killer might be. And this criminal profile was put together by none other than the famous John Douglas. Now, if you are not familiar, John Douglas was one of the first ever criminal profilers, and he wrote a book called Mindhunter that may or may not have inspired a really great Netflix series that got canceled, and I will um, never forgive them for that, quite frankly. He did go on to write a book about this case called When a Killer Calls, and fun fact, or maybe not some fact, just fact, he actually went and interviewed Larry um, once he was caught. Spoiler alert. I, I said in the beginning his name was Larry. He went and interviewed Larry um, to get more insight from him for this book. When John Douglas was putting together the criminal profile before he actually knew it was Larry and had met Larry, he said he believed that the killer in this case was a sadist. And he said that that was unique because not all killers were sadists. And sadist is described, no, defined as, quote, a person who derives pleasure, especially sexual gratification, from inflicting pain or humiliation on others. That does sound like what he's doing, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Douglas said that this killer wanted to be in full control and to take and terrorize and kill Sherry was not enough control for him. He also had to manipulate and terrorize and horrify this family in order to feel control also. And if he didn't feel control, he would become very frustrated. Anyways, the profile said that this was an organized killer. This wasn't a man who took chances. He was very, very methodical in everything he did. And they even believed that when he called the families, he was reading, or not the families, the family, Smith, the Smiths, that he was reading from a script. They thought that he would be a white male in his 20s or 30s with above average intelligence. They figured he would most likely work a blue collar dog blue collared job as maybe a day laborer. And they also suspected that he was a man who worked with electronics, maybe being an electrician and that he was local where the bodies were left showed police that he knew the back roads, tiny towns and wooded areas that were around where he left the bodies. And they also believed that he would likely have a prior criminal record. They also believe that he had likely been married before, but would now be divorced. Now I would like to know how the hell they could possibly know that. Like, Sure, knowing that he was single, like that he was divorced, sure, but how would they know that he had been married before? To me, that part's absolutely crazy. Like, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? What is the science to know that? They also believed that he would be an asocial, obsessive, compulsive type, and that he would be the type of person who would overcompensate for his own inadequacies through violence. And they also thought that he was likely overweight and unattractive. Those two things do not correlate. You can be overweight and attractive, or you can be underweight and unattractive. But this guy they thought was overweight and unattractive. Douglas said of putting together this criminal profile, and I quote, based on the way he spoke on the phone from the recordings we gathered, we could tell there was a real obsessive compulsive type of personality. He was following a script where he would try to throw the family off and keep them on the phone a little longer. No one ever starts with a crime like this. But what he failed to realize is the more we can get someone to communicate, the more we can analyze and refine our profile. Now, you remember I mentioned that in addition to calling the Smith family, in addition to talking to Don, he would call the police. Well, in his final call to police, the final call he ever made, he told police, and this was after Sherry and Deborah had already found, been found dead. He told police at this point that he would be striking again. And um, they believed him because he had proven himself to, uh, be very capable of doing this. He said that his next victim would be a pretty blonde like Deborah and Sherry, and that she would be abducted from the Columbia Metropolitan Airport. He said that she would be taken on a hot and steamy Friday, and that by the time they found her, it would be too late. Now, fortunately, this didn't happen. 
This is where police got a very big lead in the case. And this is where he got caught. And this is a, he got caught in a very interesting way to me. Okay. So you remember that last will and testament that Larry made Sherry write. Well, this was being looked into, obviously they were looking at it and through like forensic technology through science. Okay. For science, they were able to determine that on the page that she had written this letter, there were indentations on the page from where somebody had written on the page that was before it, right? So somebody wrote on the page before it, they pressed down hard enough that the indentations went into the paper that Sherry wrote on. And these indentations were the digits of a phone number. Now this just reminds me of when I was a kid and I was a genius. So when my mom would write down her Christmas lists on paper because the nineties, I would then take said paper, like the paper that had been behind it. And I would take eyeshadow and like a makeup brush. And I would go like this to try to like, <laughs> to try to like show what the presents were going to be because I too was a bit of, I was a bit of a scientist myself. Anyways, next to the phone number on the page, there is the name Joe. So they have the name Joe and they have some digits of the phone number and they are able to tell by the area code that this is a number from Alabama and they're literally only missing one digit. So what they do is they just call and add a new digit each time. There's only what, 10 of them. Yeah, there's only 10 of them. So they call, they call, they call until they get a Joe. And this is Joe Shepard. They look into Joe Shepard's phone records, right? And they're able to tell that someone from near the crime scene area was calling Joe Shepard in Alabama. And this led them to a home in South Murray. So they talked to Joe Shepard and they're like, yo, Joe Shepard, who you been talking to in South Murray? bro. And this is when he tells them like, well, calm down, please calm down. I'm just chilling in Alabama, doing my own thing, chilling, not killing. But he tells them that the number in South Murray is his parents' number. So police go and they go to check, like they get the address and they go to speak with his parents, right? This is where the calls are coming from. And this is where they meet his parents. And his father's name is Ellis. They talk to his father. His name's Ellis, as I just said. And Ellis is an electrician by trade. It's all coming together now, except that it wasn't. Well, kind of police were pretty quickly able to tell that Ellis wasn't their guy. I know it sounded like it was going to be him. I know like I was like, Oh, and then I was like, Oh, Oh, it's not him. But police were like, listen, I'm pretty sure we're onto the right. We're on the right track. Like it's clear. We've done that. We've done the research and these calls are coming from this house. The calls are coming from inside the house. So they talked to Ellis and they talked to Ellis's wife. And in talking to Ellis and Ellis, Ellis and Ellis's wife, they learn that him and his wife had actually been on vacation at the time that both murders were committed. So it was definitely not them, him, them, not connected there. But they were like, well, while we were away, we had a house sitter. Okay. And when they start describing the house sitter and they start talking about the house sitter, that's when police are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's the rum ham? The man that they had house sitting for them was a man who was in his thirties and he lived at home with his parents. This guy came and picked them up from the airport when they got back from vacation. And he was very excited to tell them all about the murders because they hadn't been there. They didn't know about him. And he did. He knew a lot about him. He had even saved newspaper articles from the murders. He had clipped them. He had kept them. And he was very interested in the cases. They said that he seemed weird. He seemed nervous. He seemed just kind of different since they had gotten back. He wasn't shaven like he normally was. And he had even lost a bunch of weight just in the time that they were on vacation. Real quick. Can we just talk about how spot on John Douglas's profile was like Holden Caulfield. Netflix, will you please bring back Mindhunter? Okay. Anyway, this man, the man we had been describing here, the man we've been talking about, the guy who was house sitting for them was a man named Larry Jean Bell. Now, Larry Bell was not like well known to police in the area. It wasn't a guy who had like a long record in the area that they knew of. And they were like, Oh yeah, we know Larry. Like, no, it wasn't like that, but he had had a history. Like he had a Rocky past. He did have a criminal record and police were about to learn that right now. Larry was born in Ralph, Alabama on October 30th, 1949. And he was one of five children. He had been married before and had a son who at the time he was arrested, I believe was 12. And he and his wife had been divorced and his ex and his son lived out of state. He had jobs here and there being both a prison guard, which like, wow, and also an airlines reservation agent, but the jobs never really lasted. And so like his work was a little bit inconsistent. He had also been in the Marines for a little bit, but he wasn't in there very long and ended up being honorably discharged after less than a year, because I believe he actually shot himself in the leg. 
From there, he was a bit of a drifter and he ended up spending most of the 70s in prison or in mental hospitals, being jailed at least four times for assault and battery and spending at least three stays in a hospital for psychiatric treatment. The details on the assault and battery charges aren't clear, but in one case at least it was described as being of a high and aggravated nature and was said to involve a knife and in another it involved a pistol. It was also said that he had gotten into some trouble for making obscene phone calls and that he had tried to kidnap a girl from a school, but he barely served any time for these crimes. And when he was arrested, he was urged to seek more psychiatric help. Like people, like it was clear that this guy was a problem and needed help and wasn't getting it. From there, he ended up moving back in with his parents and he didn't have a steady job. So he did odd jobs doing electrical work as like an independent contractor. And he had learned these skills because he had taken like three years of school to become an electrician after high school. To those who knew him at the time, he was just like a nice dude, a kind person, a gentle dude, somebody who was always down to like lend a helping hand or to look for a new cool fishing buddy. One neighbor said that they would like often go night fishing and that even after he was arrested, he still trusted him and would still go fishing with him to that day. I don't know if that's still his position, but it was at the time. And he said that if Larry said he didn't do it, he trusted that Larry did not do it because Larry had never given him a reason not to trust him and that he was a nice guy, a trustworthy guy, the type, type of guy that just like helped people and that until he was 100% proven otherwise, he would believe what Larry was saying. His arrest shocked his neighbors and like devastated his family. They were like an older couple, obviously, like, well, not older, like he's in his thirties. Like, wow. He sounded older to me. Now I just remembered he was like my age, which is crazy. Anyways, they lived in a retirement community though. So they must've been older. They must've had him later in life and they were like well-respected and he was well-liked, but honestly like well, sh well-liked, schmell liked, right? <laughs> right. Because police were pretty sure that this was their guy. All the pieces were coming together and they were about to get more evidence that would make that even more solid. Police asked Ellis and his wife if they could search their place because Larry had been there and they were like, yeah, that's fine. Let's, that's totally cool. And while they were doing this search, they asked Ellis and his wife, like, Hey, do you have any weapons here? Anything that Larry could have used to, um, subdue these girls. And they were like, actually, yes, we have a gun. And then they went to look at where that gun was and they found that it was missing. Police even took this couple to the station to let them listen to recordings of Larry's voice, like of the voice to confirm if it was him. They heard the voice and they were like, hell yeah, that is absolutely Larry. Now I know I said that he had been like electronically scrambling his voice to make it sound different, but I did read in some sources that in the last call to the Smiths, he had gotten a little bit cocky and just called using his normal voice. And this is the, the call that they listened to and were able to hear and be like, yeah, that's Larry. But anyways, they realized that the reason that their son Joe's phone number was like superimposed on Sherry's last will and testament letter is because he was working for them. He was house sitting for them. So before they left on vacation, they were the ones who wrote down, they wrote down like a list of phone numbers that he might need in case of anything happened while they were gone. And one of those phone numbers was their son Joe's phone number. So they were the ones who actually wrote this down and it was their handwriting that was superimposed on Sherry's like last will and testament, which is just like, again, I told you he was caught so interestingly. Now, this couple still had this list of phone numbers that they had given him and they were able to get that paper and bring it in. And they were able to take that paper and put it on top of Sherry's will and bing, bang, boom. They just, they fit like a glove. They then tell police like, Hey, guess what? He's expected to be at our house tomorrow morning. He's coming over to do some work for us so you can get him then. And they're like, that is amazing. Thank you for that information. So they go like the night before and they actually wait outside his house and they stock it out, stay, stock it out, stake it out in case he tries to leave in the night in case he got like some whiff that something was going on. So they wait, they wait, morning comes, they see him come out, get in his car, start to head to work. They follow him, they pull him over and they arrest him without incident. After one of the largest manhunts in South Carolina's history, Larry was arrested at a roadblock not far from his parents' home and charged with kidnapping and murder and held without bond. And he ended up being held in protective custody for several months because of the intense community outrage over his two murders. Now they're confident this is their guy, but they want a confession. So they set up like the interrogation room in such a way, like a let's make this motherfucker nervous sort of way. They put photos of the girls all over the place. They put files on the desk, like thick files with his name on it to make him think that they had more information that they did, you know, make him think they had the jump on him. They were like, we're going to do whatever we can to intimidate this guy into confessing, to make him think we know everything and to remind him constantly of the whole time 
of why he is here. Now they try this. They question him. They try to get him to confess, but he doesn't. Quite the contrary. He denies everything. He's like, no, 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 no. I didn't do any of that shit. You're not getting me. But he was unable to keep his compulsions at bay. He was unable to stop himself from his um, obsessive need to speak to Sherry's family. And he asked police if he could meet Don and Hilda. Can I meet the mother and sister of the girl? I don't know what he was thinking. Um, and I can't imagine what they were thinking. Like, I have to go in and meet this motherfucker, but they do. They go in and they sit down with him and immediately he's different. He started mumbling and not making sense, but he didn't confess. He didn't even confess when Hilda looked at him and was like, I know you're the man who killed my daughter, but I still don't hate you, which is so big of her. He started to cry. He got very emotional, but he didn't confess. Meanwhile, police are at Larry's home and they're searching that shit from top to bottom and they find that it's pretty clean. Overall, it's like a clean place. They do find that his mattress is pretty dirty, which is gross. And that under his mattress, they found like a porno magazine and also the missing gun. And in addition to that, in searching the home, they found some long blonde hairs. And when they were looked at, they were found to be microscopically similar to that of Sherry. So when the trial began, it was, the trial was held like a hundred miles away from where the crimes happened, I guess, to try to give him like a fair shot at getting a fair trial. And he went on to testify in his own defense. Like a lot of killers, they stay zip lips, stay quiet because they know they're just going to hurt their case, but not Larry. Larry went on the stand and he talked and he talked and talked. He talked for six hours, dude. And as he talked, he did everything he could to make it seem like he had some sort of mental illness. He would say things like, oh, this Larry Jean Bell wouldn't do that. That was the bad Larry Jean Bell that did that. This Larry Jean Bell would never do something like that. He would blurt out weird things and just be really theatrical in general, rambling one minute, but refusing to answer questions the next. He even claimed to be Jesus Christ. And John Douglas believed that the whole insanity act was just another form of control, like another way for Larry to try to have control so he wouldn't feel frustrated. So police put together what they believe happened that day. They think that Larry had seen Sherry. They don't think it was like really planned in advance. They think that Larry had seen Sherry when she was driving home from the pool party and that he compulsively followed her home. They think that when she got out of the car to check the mail, he ambushed her and forced her into his car at gunpoint where he then took her back to the home where he was, um, wait, was it? I can't remember if they said it was his home or if it was the home he was house sitting for. I think it was his home. At that point, he actually had plans that night. So he had to cancel his plans with his friends saying that he wanted to stay in and have a nice night. Can't even go there. Um, his nice night, his idea of a nice night was um, raping and then killing Sherry. At the end of the trial, the prosecutor who for me had a flair for the dramatic was like, listen, Sherry Smith had the strength in her to sit down and write her last will and testament. And then he picked up a pen and held it up and showed it to the jury. And it was presumably the pen used when Sherry wrote that letter and he said, now do each of you have the strength to sign your name to a death penalty guilty verdict? In the end, the jury took barely any time to convict him. I think it was less than an hour before they came back and they came back with the verdict of guilty. They said that Larry Jean Bell was guilty of the murder of Sherry Smith and he was sentenced to death. In 1987, he then went on to have a separate trial for the murder of Deborah, the kidnapping and murder of Deborah. And again, with little to no time, the jury found him guilty of all of those charges as well. So Larry Jean Bell chose to die by the electric chair, which is just again, so, so ironic considering, um, you know, that he was an electrician by trade. And he was the last person actually in South Carolina to actually be killed in this way, like to be put to death in this way. They switched, I believe, to like lethal injection after this. Now as a final fuck you to the families, Larry said that he chose this method of um, being executed so that he could die quickly and go be in heaven with the girls that he had killed. To which I say, if heaven's real, heaven doesn't want you. He was pronounced dead at one twelve. Or was it 118? One something AM. And this was on October 4th, 1996, which is actually my baby sister's birthday. Is that the same year? Wait, no, I think she was born in 94. I was going to say, I don't know what I was going to say, but I was going to say something. Anyways, the execution happened nearly 10 years after he was convicted and many members of both 
Sherry's and Deborah's families were present, but Sherry's parents did not go. They instead watched the execution from their television at home, like watched the news coverage of it. And while they did that, they prayed. They prayed for the parents of the man who was being put to death because despite everything else, they were still going to be losing their child. And they actually prayed for Larry as well, which is just like, again, I would never be so big. Now, apparently the day of the execution, there were some people like outside protesting the death penalty at the time. And as Deborah's father, because he was present, like went to walk in to watch the execution, he ended up like getting into a fight with some of these protesters. And I guess the police had to come and like break it up. And it was like a whole thing, but no charges were pressed. But still like he got like a little, like, can you imagine how high the tensions were? I truly cannot. And he went in then to watch the man who killed his baby girl, die. And he said shortly before the execution, and I quote, I really have no feelings about this. Maybe now I can get a rest. Kill the son of a bitch. Now, in addition to being like protesters being out front and all that jazz, there was also a group of Sherry's friends who went and they just stood out there peacefully and held candles in Sherry's honor um, during the execution. And Sherry's mother said seeing this and seeing that her daughter was remembered, like meant more to her family than they could ever know. So Sherry's family went on to be okay, um, considering the circumstances that they were put under, you know, her sister Dawn went on to actually become Miss South Carolina and like a beauty pageant and her like talent of choice was singing just like Sherry used to do. And she actually went on to be like a Christian country singer and she goes by the name of Dawn Smith Jordan. She ended up writing a song called Sisters and it was dedicated to Sherry and the lyrics to me are sad. I guess they're supposed to be inspirational too about how she was able to handle all this through God. Um, but to me, it's just kind of sad. And she also wrote a book um, about her and her family's experience losing Sherry the way that they did. Her parents, Bob and Hilda, have both gone on to help other parents who have experienced similar loss. Hilda speaks at women's groups and church audiences about her spiritual journey. And Bob actually works as a chaplain for the sheriff's department and has gone with officers when they have to give other families the horrible news that they've lost a loved one to murder. He's been there as to be sort of a help to help the family like hear this news and absorb this news. And he's one of the few people who can like look at them in the face and be like, I know how you feel and get even close to being accurate in saying that. Cause I don't think anyone knows how anyone feels because everyone processes everything differently based on, you know, their own personal life experiences. But he is somebody who can at least get close to how they feel because he's been through something so similar. Both of them also went on to be on the advisory board of the South Carolina chapter of neighbors who care, the NWC. Basically, this is like a prison fellowship ministry to crime victims, and it's meant to help and support those in need. I don't really understand exactly what it is, to be honest with you, but it just seems like they help other people who have been through serious loss. I'm honestly just glad to hear they're okay. I know it was really hard for them at first. I know Bob felt like particularly guilty. He felt like he had failed in some regard because he felt like it was his job to protect his family, to protect his kids and that he had failed in like the worst possible way when it wasn't really his fault. But that does seem like a difficult thing to like come to grips with, to understand it wasn't your fault and to release yourself from feeling like it was. It seems like a very impossible task. Now, I couldn't find anything really on what happened to Deborah's family and the aftermath of her loss to them, which again is very frustrating. And I get the feeling that it wasn't that they had nothing to say, but that nobody was listening. That's just the feeling that I got from the situation. I did see that after her death, some area leaders did get together to try to like raise money to try to help the family because they were really struggling right after um, she died. Sherwood, which was the name of Deborah's father, I guess like prior to Deborah being killed, he steadily worked. Like they never had a lot, but he always had a job and there was always food on the table. They were never like to the point where they didn't have the basic necessities. But after Deborah was killed, like, he, he just couldn't do it. He couldn't do anything. He went into like a depression. He started drinking a lot and he got to the point where he would just stare at pictures of her and he couldn't even get himself out of bed in the morning. From there, his wife, Deborah, who their daughter was named after, ended up being the sole breadwinner. And she wasn't making a lot. She was just working, I believe, as a waitress, making like $40 a week. And she had to have that be enough to support her, her husband, and her two remaining children, which is just like a lot. And then I guess Sherwood ended up like in the hospital and he was in the hospital for like two weeks before then going to AA. And I guess from what I can tell, he got it together at least a little bit and he got a job with a family member um, doing drywall. And that's basically all I was able to find out. Now, as generally happens in these cases, Larry Jean Bell tried to appeal. They always do. He tried to appeal on 
on things like like the jury members that were chosen and um, evidence accessibility things like that but the they were basically like listen bro sucks to suck you're staying in jail <laughs> okay you are a dangerous man which he is he's a dangerous man and he is a dangerous man that police believe is responsible for more murders Larry Jean Bell was connected to and suspected of being involved in two more disappearances. The 1984 disappearance of Sandy Elaine Cornette, who was a part-time model and the fiance of one of Larry's coworkers. She disappeared after being dropped off at home after having dinner with her fiance. And though she has never been found, it is assumed that she is dead. And it is said that Larry had seen her shortly before she went missing and he had been to her home at least once. And it's so sad too, for like a good amount of time after she went missing, her parents, her neighbors, they would try to maintain her home and like keep it in order in case she ever came back. Her neighbors would literally like cut her grass and pick up her mail just in case she came back. They wanted to keep things like nice for her for when uh, it's just like, uh, this girl just had no reason to run away. She had a good life. She had good friends. She was like beautiful. She owned her own home. She was planning to get married the April after she disappeared. Like she had everything going for her and was described as the happiest she'd ever been in her life. The way that they found out that she was missing at all is when she got dropped off by her fiance that night, she didn't call him like by 11 PM. She hadn't called him and that was unusual for her. And then the next day she didn't go to work. So he's like, okay, this is weird. So he called a neighbor and was like, can you just like go over and just check and see if she's okay? See if everything's cool. And the neighbor went in, like let themselves in her home and found that she was just gone. The TV was on and her purse looked like it had been poured out on the bed, but her keys and things like that were still there. Now, something interesting about this disappearance in particular is that when Larry was in jail for kidnapping and murdering Sherry and Deborah, he was questioned about Sandy's disappearance and apparently made some damning statements. He said things like that implied that he could lead police to where her body was. Now I did read in a newspaper article that the, pol that the judge essentially had to like decide if this hearsay evidence could be used against him to like prosecute her disappearance. It was something real weird. And the judge decided to hear what the police had to say that had interviewed him, like hear their statements, but decided not to hear Larry's side of the story. And Larry got like super pissed off about this. I guess he was like erratic in trial in general. He like had a real freak out over a pen <laughs> because it could be used as a weapon. Like this is so random, but I, I couldn't like unhear it. Cause I was like, what a child. Like, I guess, his pen got taken away from him and like he made a big thing like this vi he was very upset that this pen got taken away from him and he was like listen judge they took my pen and the judge explained to him like the policy around like why he couldn't have the pen and larry was like listen i do not accept your apology and the judge was like i wasn't apologizing bro like i just i don't know why i felt the need to tell you guys about that but i read it and i could not unremember it so now you guys know Anyways, moving on. Larry was also linked to another disappearance, and this was the disappearance of a woman named Denise Newsom Porch. She was last seen alive in July of 1975, and she was the manager of an apartment complex where she lived. Like, she was an on-site manager. And on that day in July of 1975, according to a note she left for her husband, she was showing a man, a possible new tenant, an apartment, but she never returned. There was no sign of a struggle in the apartment, and it appeared that she didn't leave on her own because she left her purse and, like, her car was still there. But the only thing that was weird to her husband is that she had left the TV and the air conditioner on. And this just wasn't like her. Like she was one to conserve the electricity. You know what I mean? So he thought that that was strange. The only things that were missing were the keys to the vacant apartments and like a log that she kept of which units were vacant. And these were things that she would take with her when she was showing a new apartment and she was never seen alive again. Now, despite an extensive search, they found nothing, no sign of Denise. And it wasn't believed like with Sandy, it wasn't believed that she had ran away because she had no reason to one, she didn't take her car and her purse. These are things that I think would probably be very useful for one who was um, running away. And two, she had no reason to run away. Her life was great. Like right before she ran away, she had just celebrated her first like marriage anniversary. Like things were going good for her. So it made no sense. She was never seen again. She was never found. And she was declared legally dead in 1982. And at the time that she went missing, Larry G. Bell lived right down the street, like super close by. I don't know if it was right down the street, but he lived very nearby where she went missing. Now, at the time that I'm filming this, I just saw like, cause you guys know, I researched like way in advance. I pre-film like a motherfucker. And I just realized that at the time that I'm filming this, um, Crime Junkies just released an episode 
well, not just, like, I think, like, you know, a week or two ago, I, I'm not sure about their schedule, but they released an episode on this case as well, and they also did a bonus episode on additional victims. Now, I haven't listened to it yet, but I would suggest if you want more information on this case or par perhaps different facts, di not facts, facts are facts, but, like, different information that was included, because, like, everybody researches differently, and maybe more information on additional victims, I think they'd be a good resource for that, because they tend from what I see to be pretty spot on. They even sometimes send like people out to the places that these happen where they can like talk to like people involved. So they're pretty thorough. They have like the resources to do things like that. So if you are curious for more information, I would suggest listening to that. I'm excited to listen to it. It's been weeks since I've been able to sit down and listen to a crime junkies episode. Like I have my priorities <laughs> just in life. Right. And then I have like my priority, like people, that I absorb their true crime content and crime junkies is on that list, but it's below others. So I haven't gotten a chance to listen to it myself yet, but I know that they're good and they did an episode on this. So I'm going to try to listen to it as soon as my tiny boss gives me a break, which is hardly ever these days. And now's the point in the video where we're going to revisit the question of the day. I've given you all the information. You have all of the details to make an informed decision. So I want to revisit it. And the question was this, do you think that Larry Jean Bell, is responsible for any other murders than the two he was convicted of. John Douglas seems to think that Sherry could not have been his first victim based on the details of that murder. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And you know what, guys, that's it. That is the story of the murders of Sherry Smith and Deborah Helmick at the hands of serial killer Larry Jean Bell. Isn't it just like so fucking sad? Because here's the thing. So often we hear stories about girls, women who go out, right? They go out somewhere and they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Things happen because they put themselves in like a position, like they leave, they go out into the world that is completely unsafe. And it puts you in a position where anything can happen to you because you're around the general public, right? Like that's what we hear about. But this wasn't what happened here. These girls were in the right place at the wrong time. You know what I mean? They were in the safety of their homes. They were in their own front yards and he just snatched them right there so close to safety so close to their parents who were right inside it's absolutely terrifying but anyways guys that completes this video i hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the details you would want when looking into this case and of course thank you for remembering sherry and deborah with me today if you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week and I'd love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, you can check in the description box. I put all my social media down there. It's all there for your convenience, along with all the makeup I used, nail polish, and also a link to my merch store where you can get a shirt like this or other really cool shirts. I just did a, a drop in this month in October, the first of October with some really cool new designs. Um, so go ahead and check that out if you want to look fresh to death. Please don't forget to let me know down below of any cases you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, I have a long list of cases and every time you leave a suggestion, I add it to the list with your name next to it so I can give you a shout out if I cover it. I love to cover the cases that you guys um, suggest because you guys have really interesting suggestions on cases that need more coverage. And I know that you're going to pick good cases because you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. And with all that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight you are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. At the very least, be better than Larry Jean Bell. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.